Hey, it's Ted from Ted Lincoln's Fishing Life here today to tell you how I won a tournament. Actually, the Hookup Sanity Glide Bait Tournament put on by both the Hookup Tackle and Bait Sanity. Um, a little bit different of a video than my normal videos. Hopefully, I'll have more this is how I won a tournament videos, or at least this is how I fished a tournament video. This is a unique tournament, uh, not normal format. It went over three months, involved one bait and, you know, measuring and points. Um, but yeah, before we get started, uh, let me pour myself a drink and cheers both the Hookup Tackle, Ben and Jeffrey and the whole crew of guides and tackle nerds at the Hookup Tackle. Don't Can't forget Griff, I guess. And cheers to Bait Sanity. Uh, those guys are awesome. I've corresponded with them since this all started. Uh, awesome people. Just, I think even Ben says in the video, some of the nicest people you'll ever meet or deal with in the fishing industry so far. I have agree they're pretty awesome. Cheers. So what is the Hookup Sanity Tournament you're asking? It's a good question. Um, it was funny because I was trying to decide right when this tournament was announced, I had just ordered a new Bait Sanity Explorer glide bait. And I was trying to decide between that and the Explorer Gill. And then they announced this tournament, so I immediately ordered an Explorer Gill. This is a new one in a box. I'll explain why I have this in a minute. Um, because it just seemed awesome. So the premise, or the concept of this tournament uh, was put on mostly by the hookup with cooperation with Bait Sanity, but it was the hookup that was running it. Um, if you don't watch their videos, they put out a weekly what's new at the Hookup Tackle. They're a high-end JDM focused um, tackle shop in Arizona. And um, they sponsor a lot of people or work with a lot of people I like and respect, like Oliver from Big Bass Dreams, is good friends with Ben, works with them. Awesome, awesome company. Um, I've ordered from them before. Everything's always come on time. Good people. And I like watching his uh, What's New on, you know, at the hookup on Sunday mornings while I drink my coffee and he drinks his beer. And I literally just ordered an Explorer Gale or an Explorer right here because I'm already a fan of the antidote. But before we get to all that, let me explain the term. The idea was we had from March 20th to June 21st to catch as many bass as we could on specifically the Explorer Gale. It didn't matter what color, which version. There's only one version when it started, but they came out with a sinking version. There's originally only a floating. And they were gonna do all the points on length like a kayak tournament. So I actually ended up buying a bunk board because in the middle of the tournament, I lost my bucket mouth uh, measuring board, bragging board, flew off the roundabout in some wind while I was measuring a uh, six pounder, I think. But yeah, so it was three months long. You measured your fish. You got one point from anything from the smallest bass, one inch, I think was in the rules, to 20.99 inches, so just under 21 inches, was worth one point. So your average bass was worth one point. Your bigger bass from 21 to 23 inches was worth four points. So that's, you know, getting up into your upper fours to six, depending on, you know, how fat it is. It can even be up to a seven pounder. I've caught seven pounders that are only 23 inches long or just under 23 inches long, but that's a pretty fat bass. And then anything 24 inches or above was 10 points. And being in the spring, it'd be either pre-spawn, post-spawn, starting into the bluegill spawn. And, you know, with all of that, bluegill are definitely on the menu for bass during that whole time period. So it was the perfect time to do it. And it was a big chunk of time. But so I watched the video, uh, literally while I was watching the video, I had an extra 60 bucks. So I ordered the bait. It came within a few days. So I think I started fishing the tournament maybe three or four days after the official start. Um, 
and it was all on Instagram uh, using the hashtag. You had to have official picture of the bait in the mouth, a picture of length with an actual measuring board. If you didn't have a measuring board, you still got a point, I think, just for catching a fish. If you couldn't prove how big it was, they still at least gave you a point. And you had to put the hashtag, hook, the hookup sanity, which ended up being a whole other problem with Instagram. Don't get me started. I'm sure a lot of you social media fishermen are just, ooh, whiskey. Social media people are aware of the issues with Instagram, trying to get away from photos. And this all happened as we were trying to tally the final results of this tournament. It is a clusterfuck. We got it figured out. Cheers, guys, again for putting it on. And I still can't believe I won. And so I won $1,000. Winner got $1,000. Second place got a gift certificate for $250 and some other prizes. And third place gets a custom uh, bait sanity bait. Um, and, you know, there was a couple dudes who kept me honest out there. Um, we all... Uh, communicated with each other a little bit, at least me in second place, uh, was it Arizona Foot Patrol, I'll show his info right here. Um, but yeah, I ordered a bait. What bait did I order, or what color? I only had one option at the time, which is floating, which is a version of it right here. I've actually gone through several of these baits during the tournament. Um, I ordered one and had a really good day that kind of put me in a good spot in the tournament early on. So. When I broke it off, I ordered two more because I was like, okay, I'm actually going to invest in this tournament. Let me try to win. So my first one was just like this. It is the Explorer Gill in what they call um, Jungle Perch. I'll put a close-up of it so you guys can see. And I'll put all the specs there, weight and everything. You're seeing it right now. Um, and I ordered this color. First, because one of my favorite places to fish glide baits and big swim baits is Rainbow River. And they are, Rainbow River is loaded with what's called a spotted sunfish. It's not everywhere in Florida. It's in a lot of the rivers. Um, I don't, I haven't really caught that many in lakes. I don't know. Um, I think they call them stump knockers too. Um, they're just basically a member of the sunfish bourbon family. But they're not as big as some of the bluegills. Like an average one's a little bit smaller than that glide bait. That's the size of about a, a pretty big one. Although I did catch a giant one recently on the Santa Fe River out with my buddy Buzz and his Kingfisher kayak guiding business, which is awesome. You guys should check them out. I'll show you a picture of this glide bait and what the spotted sunfish look like next to each other right here. And you'll see why I ordered this color. In fact, I'm getting into painting my own baits. Um, actually, just almost done building my little paint station to do it. Um, more on that coming down the pipe. Keep your eyes open. Um, something cool is coming. That's all I can say. I have to keep it a secret, but it's going to be awesome. Other than just some of my custom paint jobs. But one of the custom paint jobs I wanted to do was the spotted sunfish. I just want to do like a warm mouth and couple others that hopefully I'll show you soon but yeah I ordered the bait and I caught a fish why don't we cut to the first catch I caught um, I won't do this the bite of the day style with the edited video I'll just do the quick cast a catch just watch me catch my first fish I think it was only an 18 inch fish um, but it's a good way to start the tournament here you go watch this on Rainbow River There we go, finally. Good. Awesome. If you watch my videos, you know, like I said, that I love fishing glide baits on rainbow. The water's so clear that they're attracted to that big bait and you get to interact with the fish a lot. and. It's where I started glide bait fishing. It's one of my favorite places to fish in general. 
So it's only fitting that it became one of my favorite places to fish these big baits. Me and Atypical Outdoors, Eric, do a video there almost every year. I think we got three years worth of them now, or four years. I lose count. We go there whenever he comes. And I actually caught a pretty good one with him I, earlier before the tournament on the Antidote Glide by Bait Sanity, which is one of my favorite, two favorite glide baits. The other one being the Sneaky Peak, which you also, if you watch my channel, you're not surprised with. And let me just say off the bat, I don't work with any of these companies per se. Like I don't have a deal with G-Rat or Bait Sanity or uh, Clates Baits. My buddy is JSJ Baits, but I still have to buy his baits or trade for his baits. Um, and I have talked to the guys at Bait Sanity and to the guys at, at um, G-Rat and Clates Baits and Pro Point Lures only because it naturally progressed through messaging and tagging on social media where they got back to me and they asked for my feedback and this and that or they liked the catches and we shared. So yeah, some of them may have sent me a bait or two here and there. Like I think I got a couple rats from G-Rat. Nothing paid, no contracts, no nothing. I'm totally independent, but I also love working with people who make good baits and especially if they're cool people. And I have to say the guys at Bait Sanity are awesome just as the other guys like my buddy Josh at JSJ, the guys at G-Rat, Clates Baits, uh, Pro Point, and there's many other bait companies, but I've interacted with all of those people personally online and you know, it's awesome. And I'm glad they all make a good product and they're awesome people. Um, because like one of my favorite bluegill baits to get back to this tournament is the Gantrell Jr. or the Gantrell and the Gantrell Jr. So I actually do have a bluegill swim bait box that's just bluegill baits. And if you watched my channel last year, you saw that both the Gantrell and the Gantrell Jr. were by far my biggest bass catching swim baits. I think the Gantrell Jr. caught me more big fish than anything not my biggest fish of 2021, but the most fish between seven and eight pounds I caught on the Gantrell Jr. Caught a ton of big fish on the Gantrell. And we'll actually talk about this real quick. The difference between the Gantrell and the Bait Sanity Explorer Gill. So I, I have two of these now. Let me get back to this real quick. Two new in the box. I'm retiring this bait um, that you just saw in that video to my hall of stump of fame in my display case with my antique lures. Um, I broke off my dark gill one. I ended up having two baits after I had this really good day, which we'll get to in a minute, um, so that I would have one darker sinking and one lighter floating. So. On the last weekend, I broke off my dark bluegill color in sinking, so they replaced it for me. Uh, not for free. Bait, I bought these from Bait Sanity. They gave me a like 10% discount because I was buying two at a time. And they actually threw in these tails, which we'll get to too. I haven't tried them yet, but they're paddle tails. And an awesome bait wrap to cover up my Explorer. Um, the big bait, it's awesome. I wanted one of these anyway, so it's perfect. But so let's talk about this bait. Since the whole tournament's based around it, and then we'll get to some more catches and then to some of my equipment here. But let me open this one. This is the floating in, what is this color? Bunker. It's similar to the jungle uh, perch that I had half right there, but it's a little bit different. I just wanted to try a slightly lighter color, but it's basically the same palette. So when you get the bait, it comes in this awesome box, you know, great packaging. Um, not that I think baits need to have great packaging. I just do appreciate the effort though in good packaging, but the, real reason this packaging even matters is that under your bait 
which is in this nice foam insert. Let me pull it out. There it is. Under your bait, it comes with extra stuff, which is really handy. Um, you'll see in some of my video, or one of my videos, I think I actually catch a fish and I lose the tail, but it comes with two tails. And one is the same as the one that comes with, and one on, and each one, one comes with a little chartreuse tipped tail, which I put on a lot because um, I think our bluegill, uh, it might be true of a lot of others, um, tend to get their chartreuse tail is a little bit more pronounced during the spawn, but I think that has to also do with our darker water a lot of the time and the tannic water. Fish tend to put on their darker colors. But yeah, you get these two tails that pop on really quick and you get some suspending um, strips that are made from tungsten, not lead. So this is also another reason I didn't mind ordering the floating version because I knew I could weight it down. But yeah, um, let me open up the bluegill one, show you the difference in the color. And so this is the sinking version. It also still comes with the tungsten strips and the two tails. I'm going to be using both of these tomorrow, so I need to pull them out. So there's the two different colors I'll be throwing. And this is the original color I got. So you can see they're all pretty similar. This one's a little lighter than this one. Um, but yeah, awesome baits. But so I started the tournament with at least catching one fish. And then I went to one of my favorite lakes that I actually keep my roundabout at and um, decided. So when I started the tournament, my personal rule was that I would start with this bait and primarily fish it till at least I caught one fish that day. I wouldn't exclusively pass up perfect punching spots or perfect frogging spots, or if I saw them blowing up on smaller bait, I would still throw a topwater, but I'd say 90% of the day until I caught a fish, I threw this bait. And on my second time out, um, I caught these three fish, which I'll put here for you to watch. Um, it's a six, six and a half, and an eight. Check it out and I'll get back to you. There we go. That's a good fish, come on. 
bitch down. Yes. So after that day where I caught those fish, I'm like, okay, I'm fully in on this tournament. Let me go order another one in a sinking version. So that's when I ordered the darker color in a sinking version so that I had two bases covered. I had a floating version uh, in a light color and a color of a sunfish that they eat a lot in certain areas I fish a lot. And then I had a very good dark bluegill in a sinking version which they do actually work have a slightly different action understandably so because this one weighs a little bit more to be a sinking one and this one is a little lighter because it's a floating version even though i put the weight strips on this i'm going to do a little breakdown of um, my hook exchange and all that for you we'll cut to that and then come back here um, in a minute but with these two baits i was like okay Normally I wouldn't buy two of the same bait, but normally a lot of baits don't come in two sinking or floating versions, or if they do, they're not under $100. These being $60 is right at my like comfortable spending limit on a bait. Like I don't even like to spend that much on a bait, but I just caught two sixes and an eight. So the bait had proved itself. I'm in a tournament for $1,000, I got months to go. Let me get two baits, especially in case I lose one, I got the other. And I ended up losing both and buying two more, and then I lost the bluegill again. So I went through, I lost three of these in the three months. So yeah, it wasn't cheap. But by the midpoint of the tournament, I knew I had a chance, so I wasn't going to not buy another one to replace the one I lost. And yeah. These baits, like I said, they come in the floating and the sinking. And my other, previous to this point, we I'd mentioned earlier, my favorite bluegill bait, swim bait, was the Gantrail. And here's the Explorer Gill. And you can see they're about the same length. Um, and the Gantrail is a floating bait that dives as you reel it, but then it floats. It's almost like uh, a lipless in its way it sinks, but because it's floating, it'll, it's a slow float. It'll slowly float. And then the Explorer Gale is a true glide bait. This is kind of a glide swim. It's a three joint. This is a two joint. But you can see the Explorer is a little taller, a little thinner, and it's a little lighter. Um, I'll put them side by side on the video that you're going to watch now while I talk, showing you the difference. And um, they're very similar in terms of some of the ways you fish them, but totally different um, in other ways you can fish them. The Gantrell, um, even Tactical Bassin has brought this up. Um, it's one of their favorite bluegill baits. Um, is all about the slow, steady retrieve. And I couldn't tell you how much better this bait worked as soon as I figured that out. The Explorer Gill, also deadly in the slow, steady retrieve. There's something about an awkwardly swimming bluegill slowly across open water, especially over hydrilla or coontail or on the edge of grass, that bats are just like, we got we to gotta eat that. And those are the bites that come out of nowhere. I have a bite on this uh, seven pounder. I caught two seven pounders in a row, but one of them was literally as I was pulling it out of the water. I just stopped it to look at the bait. I was swimming it slowly and I stopped it. And I was just looking at the bait and this bass just came up and ate it. Um, the, uh, it was awesome. I'll, that's one of my bite of the days. I'll put a link in the bottom. You can watch that. But yeah, very similar in size and shape, but this is always about the slow study. This works really well at the slow steady, especially the sinking version, just because it's a little bit slower. And you, this 
the floating version will start to dive as you reel it, similar to the Gantrell, but a lot less than the Gantrell. It's more, if you unweight it, especially if you don't change the hooks and you don't put the strips on, it will want to come up more like just a sub, not quite a wake bait, but sub service, which is deadly. But the slow roll on the sinking is awesome. So I was totally stoked when I got the second bait, with, had a little bit different action that I had basically the super versatile bait. Cause like I said, I limited myself to like, every time I went out, I had to at least catch one fish on the bait for the tournament before I would really explore any other way of fishing. And there's at least a handful of times I went out and I didn't catch anything cause I never caught one fish on this. Not that I would have caught something on something else. They were, might've just been crappy days. But I mean, as you can see, I have a whole blue bluegill swim bait box. I got some big ass Vidalion mega bass. I still haven't caught anything on, but I don't throw it that much. I got the Junior uh, Gantrell, which I already told you I really like. I got a Spro BBZ wake bait, the small one, the old school one. It's not really a bluegill, but it's a bluegill shape, the six cents. Uh, was it the speed glide? I think it is. It's one of their early glides. I've had it in bluegill color, but this happens to be a shad color. Then I got all my tails for my explorer gills in there. So all of the fish that you've seen me catch so far have been on that slow, steady retrieve. On this rod and reel, which we haven't got to yet, but if you've watched my swim bait videos in the past, nothing about this setup will shock you. It is my Corrado, Shimano Corrado 200 in the 7 to 1 with a Gomexis 100 mil handle, power handle with the knobs. If you do glide bait fishing, it, the big handles with the smooth knobs, because it's all about the techniques all in the reel, not in the rod, which I'll get to as well. Um, I'm running 65 pound Berkeley X9 braid to a 20 pound mono big game, uh, Berkeley big game leader on my Dobbins Fury 806. Hands down, probably the internet's favorite swim bait rod for a reason. Budget for a hundred bucks. It totally handles this size bait and a little big, bit bigger glide bait or treble hook swim bait perfectly. Um, I could be throwing the 300 Corrado, but the 200 seems to be doing pretty well. I just recently upgraded to another rod that's a little bigger with the 300, and I don't feel like I need to get another 300. So you can throw a Corrado 200 and throw those, you know, five to seven and a half inch glide baits on this rod very comfortably. Um, I'm a firm believer, 100%, braid to mono leader on all my glide baits and I actually recently in doing this actual tournament have figured out which connection I like so I use this pro this spro snap it's like a clip but it's more of like a split ring that you can slide a bait on and off with the floating and singing version I could switch like super quick and that's why I do it because um, a lot of times I'll be fishing, especially these specific lure rod combos where you only have, I only have one rod that throws these baits. Like some of my other stuff, it's like, oh, I can have one with a worm, a spinner bait, uh, you know, a spinner bait, uh, a j small jig, a swim jig. And like I have several rods, but for my glide baits of the sides, I have this one setup that really throws it. So having a way to change baits quickly is like a game changer for me. And so this Spro clip, it doesn't open. It's just like I said, it's like a split ring that you can slide on and off without split ring pliers. And that way I could just grab this bait, take it off, grab this bait and put it on. This one still has the split ring on it. So it doesn't want to go on, but I take all the split rings off. There you go. Um, I'll show you the three sizes separately, but well, two sizes, and this is the cheap Amazon version. The Spro one's a lot better. 
I'll show you some on the side while we talk. If you actually watch the first video, I'm using a different clip. I'm using this Hyperwire, owner Hyperwire actual clip. And I decided I don't like those as much as I drop it in my boat. I like these clips a lot more. I don't trust the snap. I like the snap for baits like my topwater or my jerk bait or my crank bait where the eye isn't always easy to get to. That's the only reason I like an open snap is some baits you can't slide these clips into. A lot of the times, even my crank baits, I like these clips more than the snaps. I'm gonna put my whiskey. But so, like I was saying, those first fish you saw, all the same technique, slow reeling with the reel, just ate it. This next bite is what they call a conversion. And I'm not as good with converting followers into eaters, or I don't know if my fish just tend not to want to convert. From what I understand, it seems to be a common thing with people who fish these big baits, whether it be glide baits or big swim baits. You get bass who are just curious, and they end up following it. Every now and then you can tell just by the action of the fish that they're not just curious. They're curious and they want to eat it. It's usually, I found that the only time I can get a conversion is when there's more than one fish interested. And then there becomes competition. But before I explain, why don't you watch this little footage here and I'll tell you why this was different than the previous catches. <laughs> Dang. In that video, you can't tell, but that fish, I saw that fish coming to the bait. And just with the glare and the shadow and the water clarity, this is again just on Rainbow River. Um, he just hit a spot where I couldn't see the fish. But I saw him coming in hot, and it wasn't the first follower I had within the first few minutes I was there. Um, so, see the fish coming, I'm reeling the bait, he's getting in, and then they disappear. So as soon as they disappear, I just kind of did a couple quicker rod turns, which takes the bait from just doing like this, to and then it almost turns around. I mean, this is not new if you watch any other swim bait videos on YouTube. I mean, Matt Allen and Tim at Tactical Bass and explain this all the time. A lot of people, they just tell you to do it periodically even if you don't see a fish coming. I don't do that. I wait till I see a fish coming usually um, because I like to fish clear water with these baits. Um, but I did it that time when I couldn't see what's happening. And sure enough, that fish ate it. And there was these people working on the dock right there. They saw the whole thing happen there, cheering. It was awesome. So that put a little extra confidence in me in the tournament that now I also had this five pounder. I had already caught several other fish that I didn't have my camera working. I've had some issues with my GoPros during the whole tournament where several of my nicer fish weren't on video. Luckily I got that one eight pounder, but that's not the only eight pounder I caught. But we'll get to the stats at the end. I had also been working at a friend's house on the river that Rainbow River drains into. So for the first, I don't know, say month of the tournament, I was down there for at least a couple of weeks. And I couldn't fish all day a lot of times, but I could go out in the morning, maybe at lunch, definitely in the evening. So a lot of these Rainbow and Whistler Coochie River bass were caught just with a, you know, an hour or two here or there to fish, but I knew where to go and how to approach these fish to try to catch them, which I guess we'll talk about now, a little bit about technique and breakdown. 
So fishing a tournament like this, I mean, I don't know how many times you've heard this. If you want to catch bass on big baits, only fish big baits. And if you watch my channel, you know I catch fish on big baits, but I never only fish big baits. I'm always, I want to catch a big fish every time I go out, or at least fish or a lot of fish. Um, but limiting myself to this bait, at least to catch one fish every day that I went out before I switched wholeheartedly and mixed it up, um, really proved the point of what the people say when they say, if you want to catch big fish on big baits, you should fish big baits only because it changes the way you approach everything. You can't cast these things just half, half, I mean, you can, but if you're going to throw this thing into a spot, you better be pretty sure that you're not going to spook all the fish. You either want to cast past the spot or get just the right angle on the spot. And it's these little nuances that unless you throw a big bait, you don't get. It's just like if you never fish a weedless lure, you would never throw in the weeds like you do with a worm with a crankbait. Like you just don't think about it. But then you get a frog and you're like, oh wait, I can do all this stuff. And then you find that there's other things you can do in between. Same thing with fishing these big glide baits. Having the right rod and reel, I mean, I've had other swim bait setups before this, but when I got this setup, I understood what the praise was all about, about this rod especially. I mean, the Corrado reel is no mystery. Everyone knows that that's an amazing reel. And like I was saying earlier, I put a Gomexis power handle on, and I actually have these on all my swim bait rods, and actually my one like bigger crankbait rod that is my slash small glide bait, big whopper plopper rod. Um, they're amazing. I don't need them for like flipping or pitching or worm fishing or spinner bait fishing, but for glide bait fishing especially, um, they come in really handy because you're not using the rod like I was saying earlier. Like with a jerk bait, um, if you're fishing a jerk bait, you know, it's pause, jerk, 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 pause. You figure out the rhythm, but you're using the rod just like if you're walking a topwater or a frog or anything, you're pumping, you're reeling in a uh, lipless, you lift, you lift the rod or with a crankbait. With a glide bait, it's all on the reel. You just point the rod towards where you're going. Uh, depending on how deep it's going in the cover between you and the bait, you know, depends on how high you hold it, you tend to keep it lower. And when you turn the reel, the bait swims. Each bait is different, so you have to figure out the rhythm for that bait. Current affects it. Um, all sorts of things affect it. But it's all about the reel, and you have to figure it out with each bait. And having a nicer reel handle really improved my, I don't know. I don't know if it improved my efficiency as much as the enjoyability of fishing it. It just made it a lot nicer to fish um, with the bigger reel. It just, it just made more sense. So that's my tip number one. Get, or my number one is get the right equipment, which is the right rod, reel, and handle, and line. Like I said, I'm all about braid to leader. I, I don't even believe in fluorocarbon anymore. I, unless it's under 10 pounds, I do not own it. I do not fish it, not even for leaders. I'm done. I've lost too much, broken fish off, broken baits off, I, and I, I just don't need it. I might be losing a bite or two, but I can't afford to replace baits, and I'm tired of losing fish because it breaks. Just, it's not worth it to me. And I live in Florida. The cover's thick enough that, you know, 90% of the time it doesn't matter. And with the big baits, I think it matters even less because not a lot of people are throwing them, for one, and... There's so much cover in the water a lot of the time that they don't even see it, even in clear water. And the bait is so big that that's what they're looking at. Have I maybe not gotten a few bites? Maybe. But I still won the tournament. I don't know. People argue about it all the time. But I know for me, braid to leader, braid to mono leader, specifically big game Berkeley, which people use as a mainline for swim bait fishing, fine but i i hate the stretch of mono i love braid 
the Berkley X9 is affordable. I use it in all my rods. Um, I only use the one braid so that I'm used to it. Do I think it's the most efficient way? No, there's probably some better braids for certain applications, but I also don't want to backlash. So the more consistent I can keep all my reels, even though they're different weights, it's all the same brand and smoothness of line, makes less noise in the guides, which can't hurt. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of other smoother braids out there. Berkeley X9 worked for me. I like the V2 by PowerPro. I haven't tried any others because I can't afford them. The Berkeley's cheaper. I'm an artist. I can't afford to. I can't afford fluorocarbon for one. Like you can't use it for years. I literally have reels that have braid on them for four or five years before I replace it because it was running low. Those tend to be my spinning reels that I don't use very much. But you know, with fluorocarbon, you get a few months and then you got to deal with it. And you can try moving it from reel to reel or stretching it. But like I said, I've just lost too many fish on it. And I'm not fishing real tournaments, so I don't really care about a bite or two I lose or don't get. All right, I'll get off the fluorocarbon. Back to the tournament. So there's convergence. Um, having that reel handle or just knowing how to use your reel helps. So that's all I did was just turn the handle a little quicker than I did the other few minute, few seconds I was reeling it in. And as I was saying, I get very, very few conversions, 90%. I'd, okay, I'd say 80% of my bites are on a slow retrieve and another 15% are on the in, instant the bait hits the water or within the first reel turn where I just happen to land next to a fish, it sees the bait, just like a topwater or any other bait. You know, they see a bluegill pop and they can eat it, they eat it. Like this isn't that big to a bass. So that's generally how I get bit on glide baits is either slow retrieve or the instant hits the water. And every now and then I can get a conversion. Um, I don't think I've ever got a fish when I pop or did the twist. I don't think I've ever caught a fish doing that little extra fast reel turn where I didn't watch the fish approach the bait. I've, I've done it just blindly, but it's never turned into a fish for me. Um, not saying it couldn't, just hasn't. So I didn't only fish this bait around Gainesville. In the middle of this whole tournament, I ended up going to Headwaters, which some of you have heard of, it's specifically designed for bass fishing. My buddy, um, Greg, took me down there, his, his sponsored trip to take me out on his new boat. And he, I had been to Headwaters once before, he hadn't. So he wanted a little bit of a guide so to say, how to get around. He actually ended up catching his new PB on a Gantrell Jr. After he saw me catch this fish on the Explorer Gill, which was a part of my rule. I had to catch at least one bass before I switched baits. So as I fished this tournament, I slowly evolved my modifications to this bait. The first one that's really obvious to see is that I painted a little indicator of orange on it. See, if you look at the ones that are fresh out of the package, no indicator. And I don't put a big, super gnarly one, and I always use orange. I do it for two reasons. Sometimes, at first, I didn't know how this bait swam, so it, it helps. I put it on all my glide bait, all my hard baits now, just for one, so you can see it swimming, and you can see it coming, and if you break it off in clear water, you might be able to find it. I actually found this lure in the water the day after I broke it off in the creek coming out of Lake Panasofsky just because I saw that little orange strip sticking out of the grass. Um, so it does come in handy in other ways, especially with these darker colors, like the darker bluegill color. Like if you put that little orange strip, sometimes if this is floating on the water, you can't see it, but that orange you can see. Because I've lost a gantrell that floats, but it was all in black before I, or all in dark gill before I, that's when I started to paint the orange on these. They call it like swim indicators. You can get stickers or whatever. I just airbrush them on. Actually, I'll cut to a little clip of me doing it while I talk. You'll see me set up my spray gun and do it as we talk here. And that little strip that I'm putting on here really helps, like I said, track the bait 
and swimming, but 90% of the reason I put it on now, because especially with the baits, I already know how they swim, is to find the bait in case it breaks off. Um, it comes in really handy. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. The first few I did, I actually tried to clear coat, but at this point, I just spray it on a couple layers, just like you're seeing me do now. I'll probably do another one after this, and that'll be enough. And that's it. I mean, you can buy stickers that they make for this purpose. You can get paint markers and do the same thing, and you can even do white, but it helps. And it, especially if you're new to a bait or even glide bait fishing in general, I highly suggest at least doing it to a couple of your baits to watch how they swim. So the other thing with it, that's really cool with these baits is they come with a rubber bumper to make the bait a little quieter. I mean, that's all the hooks. Not so well attached. So before you fish this bait, glue it on. Just a dab of super glue. This is actually in two parts. There's actually half of one sitting here. See? Put a dab of super glue in the center because it's in two parts. And that's usually enough. If it starts to peel up, I'll just dab super glue. I always have super glue on my boat just for a lot of other reasons, keeping baits on. So I just kind of look at it from time to time, make sure that's still on. If you lose it, it's not a big deal. The bait is just slightly noisier, which might even be better uh, for certain occasions. It also comes with these tungsten strips that I was telling you about which I'll show you where I place them in this video here. Um, basically you peel and stick them where I'm showing you. I'm not going to peel and stick them for this video, but you get the idea. There's a good spot to put them. Um, Bait Sanity actually came out with a whole line of these now, like our different sizes, not just the one. These were the first ones they had, but you can buy these for other baits. I plan on buying them. I mean, Storm makes the lead ones, the suspend strips, which I actually have on the antidote um, to make it sink just a little bit faster because in current sometimes you need just a little more weight and Rainbow River has current um, where I fish a lot. And then the other major modification that you can watch evolve actually through the videos just like the split rings is my hook choice. The hooks that come with this bait are awesome. Nothing wrong with them. Um, in fact, I just switched the hooks from here to actually, I ended up putting them on this, on my topwaters, these big 128 Sammies. Those are all my bait sanity hooks. They are awesome hooks. I have just switched almost all my glide bait hooks to originally um, these. These are the G Finesse trebles. I don't do all my glide baits. I do 90%, I should say. All the glide baits I fish in rainbow and clear water, this is what I throw. I do put owner SD36s on baits where I'm going to say fish Rodman or like Orange Lake or somewhere where I know like there's not only really big fish, there's a ton of cover that I'm going to have to pull the fish and the bait through if I hook a big one. Um, actually, the thinner hooks work better around cover in terms of getting your bait back because they don't tend to dig, they tend to rip. So like they'll rip through pads instead of getting stuck in pads. It's my same theory that I have with my popper and gunfish where I like the two like size, whatever, four trebles that come on the baits because I can throw them literally through lily pads and just pop them out of the pads and they rip instead of getting stuck and pulling the pad out. Same thing with these hooks. And these G Finesse hooks were the first hooks I could get um, that I knew about. I'm sure there were others out there, but this is the first in the general public that had a Teflon coating. So these are the size one. These are the ones that I originally put on the Explorer Gill and I still have as the back hook on the Explorer Gill. And first of all, second of all, like, or just as a side note, Explorer Gill, like a lot of other good glide baits, has rotating hook hangers, which is amazing in terms of, you know, you're keeping the hook pinned in the fish. It just makes it harder for them to throw it. Not impossible. We're going to get to a heartbreak in a minute. 
but yeah. The reason I put these hooks on is that you can't even touch these hooks. Like you can't even like, it just hooked me. Like look at this. This is one in my leg. So this bait got stuck in a bush. I pulled it free and it just literally hit my leg and that hook got stuck. Um, I had already made a video about me pulling a treble hook out of my finger, so I didn't get that on tape. But I pulled that hook out in a similar manner by myself. Um, very painful. Always keep a set of dikes and a first aid kit on your boat, no matter what you're doing, in your backpack. Trust me, it's just, when you're dealing with hooks and fishing in general, some antiseptic and some wire cutters and some band-aids are like, life they just help you a lot um, I have several videos now with me hooking myself and getting them free um, I'll put a link to those in the bottom but I mean just from that picture you saw like I mean that was in the middle of this tournament I ended up catching a really good fish that day um, but I had to switch out my hook because I cut it off to get it out so since the beginning of this tournament I actually discovered another hook that I have switched a lot of my glide baits partially to. Um, it's the owner ST, was it 35 Stinger? It's also coated just like the um, G Finesse. Here's one out of the package. Here's a really big one. So the difference, I'll cut to this photo where you can see, is that the two are f barbs sit flat and then the one barb sits up instead of being evenly into thirds. And what that does is it allows the bait, the hook, to lie flat against the bait closer. And not only does it do that, while it's lying flat, the points are actually sticking out from the bait a little bit better. So it comes over cover better but gets better hookup when you get bit, if that makes sense. I guess it gets snagged on cover as you come by it, which if you fish glide baits are on cover, you know how annoying that is. They basically lose all their action with just like a tiny piece of grass. This is the only super frustrating thing about glide bait fishing in Florida, especially, is getting a tiny piece of grass on your glide bait and ruining a whole cast. So I've switched all the front hooks of my bluegill baits, including the Explorer Gill, to that owner ST35, both in a size one. And they're basically just as sharp, both coated with like a Teflon nano coating. I mean, I've still lost fish that have bit this, but it is a lot harder for a fish to even bump this. And if this hook even like lightly touches you, it's stuck. And then so it sticks the fish, and as soon as they turn, they get the other hook. It's, I don't even mess around with glide baits anymore. Like people think they might be too light. And like I said, I'll put on the Owner ST36, which is almost as sharp. It's almost basically like the hook that it comes with. These hooks are ridiculously sharp too. I mean, you can barely touch them. That's why they're on my top water. Um, they're slight EWG shape and you know, they're, Bait Sanity definitely did their research of getting the hooks weight right with their bait. So like I actually tank tested these, or not tank, I have a little container tested them. So I'm actually using specific split rings too. I have this one triple thick split ring. I'll show you a close up of it. And then I have a Spro power ring in the front. And that basically, because I take the split ring off and I'll take one of these clips and I'll take the bait and I floated it in my little container. I guess I can make a little video of that for you guys right here. So I floated the bait in the container after I put those weight strips on and watched it sink with the stock hooks and ring and tried to recreate it with the hooks and rings I like. So since this adds weight, these hooks are a little lighter. I put a heavier ring on the back and a lighter ring on the front. It's still very strong ring. I'm sure the rings that it came with are awesome too, but this was me creating the solution to getting the same sync rate and using the hooks that I have confidence in. Um, 
is it, do, did I need to do that? No. I mean, I'm sure I would have caught just as many fish with the stock hooks, but it makes me feel better about it. And I, like I said, I still lost fish on them. So it's not hundred percent, but I mean, I have it. This one has both ST 35s on both hooks. Um, if the glide bait, if the back hook sits up under the bait, like the front hook, that's when I use the ST35. If the back hook hangs down a little, I'll put the uh, G Finesse treble on there. Um, equally as sharp, it's just the shape of the hook that I, I prefer. And also some of the baits like the Explorer doesn't have rotating guides, so having that flat side sit up under there really helps. But yeah. On our ST35s and the Gamagatsu G Finesse, I mean, if you've had them, you understand. Awesome hooks. So before I get into a breakdown of like the actual fish I caught and the stats, let me show you the last big fish I got on tape, um, which was like a six pounder. Um, on the last weekend I went fishing for the tournament, I actually caught one of the biggest fish of the tournament the day before, actually no, the day after, later that day, there was a thunderstorm, so I got off the water both days. So they kind of all blend together into, like I don't know which day was which, but I think after this fish I caught an 8.3 or 8.6, I have to look up which one it was. But my GoPro wasn't on, but I got this six pounder. Um, actually before we go into the set, after we see this video, I'll explain to you how I fish these baits and what's different about them from normal baits. There we go. That's a good one. That's the one I need. Come on. Uh, yeah. oh. <laughs> so in this video is a prime example of fishing the grass line, which you know we do with a lot of baits. We'll do with a chatterbait, we'll do a swim jig, we'll do with anything that you don't always want to start or can't fish in the grass. But like I was saying earlier with the glide baits or the big swim baits in general, you have to like pick and choose your cast a little bit more because it's just such a big presence in the water. I don't, I haven't noticed the splash per se scaring the fish, even with like the 10 inch mag draft, which is out of all the baits I throw, probably the heaviest for its size where it just literally smacks the water. But like if you're out, say on Rodman, they're like giant mullet jumping all the time. And you know, you don't watch fish like flee from that jump. Like they just jump and nothing happens. Like I don't, there isn't a bass eating them when they land. You don't see all of a sudden every bass around it like jet off like you do when you get near a bass with your trolling motor. So I don't think the splash necessarily, unless you land right on the fish, but that's true of any bait. I don't think that necessarily scares the bass. I do often, almost all the time, as soon as the bait lands, whatever swim bait it is, but especially glide bait, I do two quick reel turns. Just in case there's a bass sitting there, it's like a fish getting chased and lands in the water. He's not just gonna stop, he's gonna take off. So I'll just go and then go into the slow. And a lot of times they'll hit it as soon as it hits the water, I don't even get to slow down or even get to the real turn. Um, but then I'll start reeling in methodically along the edges of stuff. And like I was saying, this throwing these big baits makes you think about your setup a little bit differently. Just like when you start fishing punching baits or frogs, you have to set up a little differently or you can set up differently to fish those baits. Um, during the Bluegill spawn, if I knew they were spawning on the lake I was at, I definitely targeted any kind of 
cove or point leading up to a flat where the bluegill might be um, spawning. I actually have a video we'll go to showing me do that. Um, it wasn't that big of a fish, it's this 18 inch fish, but you can watch me throw. I knew there were bluegills spawning back there because I've seen them spawn in that cove before. I've never caught a fish there before in that spot, but I started swimming it out and there's like the flat and then some coontail and then deep water. And as soon as I came over that coontail, that 18 inch bass nailed it. Why don't you watch that video right now? Hey, so you can see what I mean, like you just nailed it. Um, glide baits in general, I mean, obvious stuff like fishing the edge of pads and the edge of grass or reeds. You, with my roundabout or this small boat, I'll tend to approach a spot and I don't have power poles. Um, if I'm in the roundabout, I'll use an anchor. In this boat, I tend to let it get blown up against the grass. I'll fish that area as we get close and then I can fish in each direction from there, um, unless it's super windy and I get blown in the grass and then I have a peg that I'll use uh, with my little handmade anchor peg mount I have in the front of the boat. But it, definitely fishing parallel to cover or across points or over flats with submerged vegetation becomes what you have to do instead of just something to do. You don't get those extra casts in between as much. I mean, you can, but a lot of times you're wasting your effort or you're scaring some fish or you're creating a situation where you're not set up for the next cast. So I'd rather be slower and more methodical with my cast. That being said, I've also targeted fish and or I should say targeted cast to structure very close to me. Um, actually, one of my favorite catches, which we'll go to in a second here, I was on the river, it had poured rain, my boat almost sank, I had to put the bilge on for two hours, change clothes, went back on the river, found flowing water in a tree next to some pads. Never gotten a bite there before. I'd fished that area many times before. I just threw up neck, just past the tree and swam the glide bait just into the calm water behind the tree, the break behind the tree. And the, this fish nailed it. There we go. That's a good one, come on. Come on. <laughs> that six pounder nailed it right behind the tree and I went immediately after that across the river and did a short pitch with this glide bait. I mean there was no weeds per se, it was under a tree, beside a tree, but I mean the cast was maybe 15 feet, 20 feet long and as I was wheeling it out, an even bigger fish than that six pounder grabbed it and nailed it. But I only had like, you know, six extra feet of line out. So hooked it, it jumped once and got off. That's the only thing you gotta worry about with any of the big baits is there's just so much leverage with that bait when they shake that they can come off. No matter how good your hooks are, if you just don't have them pegged right, they can shake it. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't we share the biggest fish I've hooked of 2022, which came off during this tournament. Why don't you watch this one and out? There's no need to explain what happened, but you'll see. There we go. That's even better one. Oh my God. That's a big one. Ah!
So in this video, you saw that I lost this double digit and I was actually reaching for the net because this was right after the day after I had the hook in my leg. So I was pretty, pretty wary of treble hooks. And if you actually watch most of my videos, I don't even worry about a net 90% of the time. I lip my fish. I just grew up without a net in the boat. I grew up bank fishing without a net and you know, I just, it doesn't occur to me grab the net 90% of the time, but I've pulled enough treble hooks out of myself in the last year or two that I started looking for my net. Um, and basically I didn't keep my rod tip down and that bass was allowed to come up. Um, you can look up videos on this and I'll actually make a video about it at some point. But if you feel a fish coming up, you want to put your rod tip down. But since I was transitioning and reaching down, even though I had pressure on the fish, my rod tip was way up in the air. And when it came up, it just had Pressure on that lure came off. Oh well, I still won the tournament without it. It would have been nice to catch something in the double digits um, for the tournament, but I'm not going to complain. So now we'll get to the stats for the tournament. Just tell you what I did to win. I got something like 500 something points. Um, I'll list the. Here's a picture of the final announcement that I won with the points. I got 29 bass total in the three months from March 20th to June 21st. 19 of them were the one point bass under basically like 12 inches to 19 inches. The most common size I caught was 18 inches. Um, I caught four fish that were 18 inches long during the whole tournament, which isn't a lot, but that's like the most in one inch increments. Um, and then I caught, the smallest one I caught was 12 inches. I caught three of them that were 19 inches and was it 14 of them were between 13 and 16 inches. I caught six fish for the four point category, the 21 to 23 something, um, 22, 22 and a quarter, 22 and a half, uh, a 21 and those are all between six to seven something pounds. I got weights on all those On the way out of this video. I'll do the little photo collage montage of all the fish I caught um, That I got pictures of because they're not all in video um, Just as we wrap up the video just so you actually see the proof that I caught them, but you know and then the ringers where I got four over 24 inches one was right just a little over 24 um, Three of them were FWC trophy catches over eight pounds. Um, eight pounds, six ounces was the biggest, heaviest. It wasn't the longest. It was only 14 in, or 24 and a half inches, but it was the fattest. I got a 25 and a half. That was eight three. A 24 and a half, that was eight one. Um, the eight three and eight one were definitely just post spawn. So for us, the spawn happens earlier than a lot. So by the time, a lot of other places. So by the time March 20th came around, most of our big fish in the waters I fish had already spawned. Some of the lakes, they'll spawn twice, um, but they hadn't done that in the lakes I was, or rivers I was at this year. Um, so the 24 and a half, that was eight, six, had just eaten something really big, probably a bluegill or maybe even another bass or a big shiner. So that's why she, um, it was actually one of the last fish I caught in June. So she's way post-spawn, fully recovered. The other eight pounders were more in the March time period. So they were definitely just off the spawn and they were feeding back up. So just goes to show you that in the late spring, you can still catch bigger fish. Sometimes you can catch bigger fish than in the early spring here in Florida because they have had time to bulk back up. Well, that pretty much covers the Hookup Sanity Tournament and how I won it. As we wrap up the video, we're going to cut to me dedicating my lure to my stump of fame over here in my office. Um,
I'll do that montage of all the fish I catch on the way out. Um, again, I can't believe I won. It was awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to trying this new color and getting back out there with these baits. Um, I didn't want to lose the one I had before I made this video and before I put it in my stump of fame. I'm definitely going to try these paddle tails. I, they have another tail called the Adam tail, which I haven't got. I have not fished these at all yet. I fished these all stock. Most of them I would put the chartreuse tail on. Um, I'll put a little video of me switching the tail out if you want. Like I was saying, I still can't believe I won. I gotta thank everybody involved. Thank to Bait Sanity for making such a great, great bait and working with the Hookup Tackle and Ben and you know Jeffrey and all the guys over there. Jeffrey, I'll drink your share of whiskey. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Thousand dollars saved my butt. I had a really tough spring and um, new landlord and whatnot. My rent, whatever. Life has been difficult. Winning an extra thousand bucks for having fun fishing a glide bait came in handy. I learned so much by forcing myself to fish the bait. You guys should try. Pick a glide bait and just, you know, take it out a few times and really fish it. And if anything I said here helps, let me know. Um, different waters need different techniques. This is what I do from here in North Central Florida. Apparently it worked well enough. Um, what, what can I say? I'm honored to win. Thanks to Foot Patrol Fishing in PC Bass Slayer. I'll put their Instagrams at the bottom. That was second and third. Um, and everyone else who participated in the Hookup Sanity Tournament. Um, you guys kept me honest, like, especially Hookup or uh, Foot Patrol. Like, him and I started talking, and I was just definitely like, oh, I got to keep going. Like, can't slack off. Got to fish that bait every time I go out. I got lucky that I needed, I was by the water a lot during these few months doing, doing work. So I had some time off or easy access to water on my time off. Um, right at the right time to be throwing a bluegills glide bait. Um, I love this bait. I'm glad the tournament made me fish it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Gantrell is still great. Totally different. Floating and sinking version were key for my success. Those modifications were just fine tuning. You fish these straight out of the box. You don't have to do anything I did. Um, with that said, thanks for watching. I'm Ted from Ted Lincoln's Fishing Life. Hope you appreciate this uh, photo montage of the end of all of the fish I caught in the bait sanity hookup. Was it the hookup sanity? Fishing Tournament. I'm Ted from Tim Lincoln's Fishing Life. I'm out.